Om Amriteshwari Namaha. A warm welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you for joining us today. I want to start by expressing our gratitude to C20 Chair Amma, Her Holiness Mata Amritandamayi Devi for making this event possible. Emerging technologies and education in resource limited settings brings together eminent speakers, change makers and thought leaders in their field of expertise. I now would like to introduce Dr. Krishnashri Achudan. Dr. Krishnashri Achudan, National Coordinator, C20 Technology Security and Transparency. Dr. Krishnashri Achudan is a distinguished academic and researcher, currently serving as the Dean of Postgraduate Programs at Amrita Vishwavidya Pedam, a renowned university in India. She is also the National Coordinator of C20 Technology Security and Transparency, where she plays a pivotal role in advancing these critical dom domains. She also holds multiple significant positions at Amrita University, including heading the Center of Cybersecurity Settings and Networks and the Amrita Technology Business Incubator, Amrita TBI. In addition, she serves as the Associate Director of Indo-US and International Initiatives, fostering collaborations and partnerships on a global scale. Her research interests span various fields, including cybersecurity and governance, mathematical modeling of systems, cybersecurity policy, IoT security, public safety, innovation, education technology, and entrepreneurship. She has an impressive track record with over 32 patents and more than 130 publications to her credit. She actively lead the research teams at Amrita University focusing on enhancing laboratory education through focusing on the development of virtual uh, laboratories. Her commitment to advancing Techno education technology and fostering innovation is in evident in her extensive contributions to academia and industry. Furthermore, she has played a critical role in several strategy in strategical in in initiatives for the government of India, where she has served as the principal investigator. Her expertise and guidance have been instrumental in shaping the policies and driving advancements in various sectors. A very warm, heartfelt welcome to each one of you, and we are privileged and excited to welcome you to the panel event for digital transformation. Uh, now, I would like to welcome Krishna Sri Ma'am to take over the session. Om Amriteshwari Namaha. A very, very warm welcome to this C20 Summit on Education and Digital Transformation. It is an honor and privilege to be here, especially working for Amrita Vishwadhyaya Peetham, an uh, institute of excellence that has done extremely uh, long-term impact work related to education and educational technologies. I really warmly welcome our distinguished guests on the dais who have done decades of work in the area of education and technology, as well as our distinguished attendees, Sir Dr. Anil Sahasrabhudde, sir, amongst many, who are known as pillars of uh, educational excellence, who have brought about transformation in educational excellence across the country. Now with that, I'd like to start with a quote of Amma's that Swamiji mentioned yesterday, the true purpose of education is to impart the culture of the heart. The quote by our Honorable Civil 20 Chair, Sri Mata Amritandamayi Devi. That said, I think we are living in a world that is filled with challenges, especially related to education. Education we all know and understand is fundamental to any kind of transformation, both at a personal, community, national, international levels. Um, I'd like to just mention a few statistics related to uh, you know, what our world is seeing today in terms of education. Uh, some of these data is coming from UNESCO directly. It says that basically one of the biggest global achievements has been that what used to be like 
50% of children not having lack of access to schools and primary education has reduced significantly to about 11% today. Now, this has been one of the greatest achievements of our modern world in being able to provide this kind of access to education. However, we still have that 11% that have no access at all across the world. And the second part of it is that about 70% of 10-year-olds in low and middle income countries are unable to even write simple written text. So this just shows how ineffective education can be. And all of us have been, you could say, uh, audiences to poor quality education. In spite of being in one of the biggest, foremost developed countries of the world, such as India, I can say that there are still challenges, such as rote learning, such as learning for the sake of learning by many, many students across the world, primarily because, uh, not because of their lack of interest, but just that they don't have exposure to the best possible teachers who are inspiring them to be able to learn, to be able to think, especially do critical thinking and problem solving. So this is something that is currently present across the world, whether it is developed or developing nations. We see that the quality of education, access is, is one problem, but secondly, quality of education is equally important for somebody to, be, to become a successful professional in whatever they may choose to do. Thirdly, I'd like to just mention about the fact that 93 million children in the world are disabled. So what are the possibilities for them is another very, very big question we are wanting to tackle as part of this conference as well. So it really requires us as multiple different types of stakeholders to discuss and bring together at least some level of policy recommendations that are actionable, that are very practical, to propose to the G20 countries so that we can actually create an impact. Just hailing from Amrita Shudya Peetham, I can say that our, one of our major pillars has been to look at technologies for education and for a very diverse set of audiences, from vocational uh, education to primary education to school education and higher secondary education, as well as college education. Amrita has dedicated several resources and has really built technologies that millions of students use, not only in India, but across the world. Um, so, so we have been in deeply engaged in the cause of education. We are, and to a large extent, I think, we'd like to take this discussion today to what we can do for the world together. So with that, I'd like to introduce our very distinguished panel uh, guests here today. The first. Dr. Nachiketa Mohanty, who's the Associate, Associate Director of JIPEGO India and USAID RISE. He has been an esteemed professional, has served uh, JIPEGO, where he contributes also to the USAID program, and he holds a position as a Deputy Chief of Party overseeing health systems development for USAID's flagship COVID response program in India. And he has made remarkable contributions to the field of healthcare. His extensive experience encompasses clinical and operational research, healthcare administration, monitoring and evaluation, as well as mass communication and health-related issues, encompassing both prevention and treatment. And he is actively engaged in addressing critical health concerns, notably focusing on tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, family planning, and women's cancer. So, very, very warm welcome to you uh, to this uh, summit. I'd like to really request you to kindly speak about your thoughts. I know medical education is a completely different animal, and I think we don't have enough doctors in the country. That aside, we really do care about our medical doctors getting the best of education. So especially in resource-constrained environments, what are your thoughts about how medical education 
can really impact or what, an, what can technology do, uh, do towards medical education? Thank you so much. Um, actually, if you allow me, I have a quick presentation on what, uh, uh, you know, how the medical education uh, landscape has changed and, uh, you know, what, what we have done in, during the pandemic situation. Uh, not this one, actually. Thank you. Uh, so, just to start with, uh, Japaigo is a Johns Hopkins University affiliate, and uh, uh, it's one of those premier medical institutions globally, also, uh, Johns Hopkins University. And uh, Japaigo has been there in uh, India for around 20 years, working in uh, medical education healthcare education within the public health institutions largely uh, for maternal health, family planning, reproductive health, women's cancer. And when, when, once the pandemic started, we actually entered into critical care also. And so that's been uh, a journey uh, that uh, Japaigo has had. And uh, in the last 20 years, technology has been a large part of it, the education within uh, health. And I'll uh, just showcase what what happened during COVID and uh, what we did through the USAID RICE project uh, shortly. Uh, so when the COVID started, uh, one of the most critical areas where critical care, oxygen lab, where there was a requirement for uh, you know, healthcare personnel to be trained on. So uh, RICE came in to support the critical care, biomedical waste management, COVID diagnostics, vaccinations, and medical oxygen ecosystem. Uh, not only training, but uh, you know, also ensuring that there is assistance for uh, their growth. So there was a health system strengthening and uh, pandemic uh, preparedness and response uh, assistance that was provided through a network of institutions. This network included more than 2,000 uh, spokes and 70 hubs. So we created a learning network which could conduct uh, fig uh, conduct digital learning ecosystem, uh, build a digital learning ecosystem, do upskilling of the manpower, and also have, uh, uh, you know, uh, provide assistance for the infrastructure. So we conducted more than 800 uh, interventions and, uh, uh, it, you know, competency enhancement interventions, training more than 67,000 healthcare providers, uh, which included doctors, nurses, lab personnel, oxygen handlers, all of that. So what were the challenges that we faced when we started out? Uh, and largely, historically also, uh, within the public health system, the normal way of training is that of uh, a, a cascade training, physical, didactic training. People would have to come into the classroom. You would have to, you told them. That's how the healthcare uh, trainings used to happen. Competency, meaning skills, were not exactly being addressed at that time. You know, it's uh, more on knowledge, less on skills. That's how the focus of healthcare education was. And uh, there was always a lim limited use of interactive techniques within the uh, public health education. Uh, so we know that the digital learning uh, you know, trend is in the youth in this generation actually understands technology better than what like, 30 years back, when I were, you know, went into school or uh, you know, 20 years back, back when I was in the medical uh, college, to me, a presentation, a, 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 a training which included slides was exciting. That was interactive training for me. But when you go into a, um, uh, you know, any training today, uh, someone's teaching with a slide deck, that's that's not interactive. That's, that's what 
what to me at back the, then, you know, 20, 25 years back was like, you know, uh, sitting in the classroom and just hearing to, to a lecture. So trends have changed, but have we, have our infrastructure, uh, has our infrastructure changed to reach there? Do we have, uh, you know, that kind of digital connectivity at all these healthcare institutions to conduct these kinds of trainings? No. Not in the public health facilities. Private institutions, yes, many of them. Of course, you know, if we talk about Amrita, probably you definitely have a better, a lot uh, better infrastructure. But when you go to the public health system, well, public health medical institutions, they obviously have that issue there. The trainers lack those technical skills of understanding how the digital learning can be incorporated into their training mechanisms. And there's, of course, this affordability and accessibility of the devices that have uh, issues. Something that applies to the entire, uh, you know, wherever skills are required, wherever, you know, uh, not just healthcare professionals, but wherever your skills are required, there's a, uh, there's a pathway for training. First, if you look at the bottom, someone first understands, they know when you train, that you, you can impart knowledge. But then gradually you, uh, the knowledge, you, you can improve it by adding skills in the training. So you can show them how to do that. In, in the medical education, we use OSCEs, uh, which is your uh, objectively scored clinical examination that could be added to, this, uh, to improve their skills. And then you look at the performance to see if they can perform the skills. So that's what we tried to build in through uh, during pandemic because in a very short time we wanted to also uh, move a, a cascade training would require people to be trained by one group of mentors who then train others then who train others you didn't really have the time to do that so what we did was we went into a hub and spoke mechanism where a hub we selected hubs who could conduct trainings directly, hands-on, and uh, both physical and digital. So we called it a digital learning ecosystem. And that's where we also partnered with Amrita Create. We uh, partnered with them for developing an application called Disha, which is a case-based learning application. We also imparted trainings through Zoom, through Teams, uh, and also had physical trainings where we could uh, do um, you know, uh, share, uh, we have developed simulation model, uh, uh, simulation labs, uh, five simulation labs were established. Uh, we also had learning resource packages developed, tools developed, and uh, these uh, uh, simulation labs that we developed, uh, established, uh, we developed it in five, but we also supported two other states, and we are also supporting other states because RISE is present in 20 states. Uh, and uh, this case-based learning platform, which uh, helped uh, in the clinical skills and tracking uh, competencies, also had a game, gamification component. It also has a v virtual reality component to make it interesting, interactive for the person who is learning it. So wherever we have shown this to uh, across uh, states, within the public health system, there's a lot of acceptance. They want to take it up immediately. Andhra Pradesh immediately took it up. Say, we immediately had the state sending out a letter to all nursing and medical education within the public health system saying that we want to do it in this way. Disha immediately got launched. Karnataka took it up. Uh, and gradually we know that all the states are going to take it up. Uh, and uh, we, we recently showcased in was Assam and West Bengal and the, the health uh, secretary and additional chief secretaries, they were so happy. They said, this, is, this is exactly what we want. So this this culture of how you educate needs to change and within the medical uh, uh, ecosystem, medical learning ecosystem and I think um, technology has to be inbuilt to it. So the key lessons that we learned uh, during the pandemic and that's my last slide is that your training has to be, you know, it has to have a hybrid there has to be hybrid training approaches. You cannot stick to the age-old system of trainings where you conducted, you know, uh, physical training. People had to come in your classroom-based trainings. Doesn't work anymore. 
there has to be a lot of collaboration and partnerships. You have to work with, so we, we partnered with Lairdal for the simulation labs, we partnered with Amrita uh, Vishwavidya Bitam and Amrita Create for those, uh, uh, for the Disha case-based learning platform. We partner with all the hubs for conducting these trainings, all the 70 uh, medical institutions across these 20 states to conduct these uh, trainings. So collaboration and partnerships are key to ensuring that uh, uh, you, know, you enhance the healthcare education using uh, 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 the digital technology. Uh, quality assurance is key. We establish critical care working groups who would be able to ensure that there's oversight to these trainings that happens in these uh, uh, institutions. Uh, there has to be a governance mechanism that has to come from a political commitment also. Um, there has to be customization and contextualization. Not everyone uh, understands teaching the way we normally have been teaching traditionally for a long time. It has to change. And uh, there has to be resource allocation. Um, USAID came in, uh, you know, RISE came in, and then we had these resources to do this simulation labs, this Disha platform, but someone has to take it forward and it has to be done at a scalable level by the government. So the government has to allocate resources and ensure sustainability to this. So this is something that uh, has to uh, apply across the board. So these are some of the learnings that we had uh, from RISE that I wanted to share. But uh, apart from RISE, you know, J Japaigo has been using digital technology at the community level. So RISE has been largely in secondary and tertiary level healthcare facilities, but at the community level also, through another program called Nishta, we have been, we had something called I Learn, which was for the ASHAs and the ANMs who could use it uh, during the pandemic, training them on you know how to take care of a COVID patient, how to you know what are the things that uh, you need to know. Uh, to um, identify if someone needs to be screened for COVID. So those, uh, these digital platforms uh, are something that, you know, uh, are going to help for the public health system and, has, and there has to be more inroads into it, more, uh, you know, onboarding more and more of these applications of, of these platforms that will allow that, uh, allow, although, you know, Technology, uh, in terms of connectivity, will stay an issue till the time that uh, you know we don't make it more affordable. But it still is something that uh, I'm sorry. Maybe I took a lot more time than I should have, uh, but that's uh, that's my thought. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Mohanty. Very insightful. I think I couldn't agree more that. The, the use of hybrid technologies, collaborative partnerships are going to be very, very fundamental, even to perhaps even scaling this. You know, you've described a very nice amount, I mean, the, the extent of work done here in India, but these are some things that can also be very trans translated to other areas across the world, especially when there, where there are, you know, significant types of emergencies happening as well. Now let's let's go to our next speaker. Is Joyce um, online? Not yet. Okay. So um, let's move on to. So I have with us Dr. Vijay Vimalapalli, who is the secretary of Vibha, um, and he is actually a, a software engineer uh, by background, and he's from Equifax Inc. in Atlanta, and. Um, he has been a volunteer of Vibha since 1993 and has played a critical role in the growth of the organization on several fronts. And over the years, he has been instrumental in forming the National Vibha Volunteer Network, starting uh, the Atlanta Action Center. And he's also been a uh, member of the Project Selection Committee there. So very, very warm welcome to you, sir. Would love to hear your thoughts on the emerging technologies and its impact, especially coming from very resource-constrained environments. I know that in the U.S. that would, should not be a big problem, but how your work has impacted other parts of the world. Thank you for that introduction. <coughs> and uh, thank you, Amma Organization, for uh, inviting me to be a panel member for the C20 uh, Working Group on Education. I uh, represent uh, an organization called Vibha, a volunteer-driven nonprofit organization with more than 800 volunteers in several cities in USA and India, uh, supporting 
about 20 partners in India in 12 states focused on education. Recently, we have sharpened our focus on public education and working with several scalable models and working with uh, some state governments to implement them uh, at scale. So today, I have a bold proposal. I don't know whether it is bold or may not be, uh, but would like to uh, present this to the uh, leaders of the G20 uh, summit. Before I go into the proposal, let's take a quick look on the status of primary education in India. We have some great news and not so good news. Uh, as the moderator had said in the beginning, we have made some tremendous progress on access to education. Thanks to the right to education in India, we have 98% children have access to India. About 73% go to uh, public schools and another 25% go to private school. But in all, about 98% children have access. That's great statistic. The next one, Another key indicator, attendance. This is also, we have made some really good progress. The average is at 72% it is good, but wherever there is midday meal program, in effect, the, it, is, it is much higher at about 80 to 90%. So some great news there as well. When we talk about the learning levels, that is where we have uh, much to be desired. Uh, based on the recent ACER statistics, only about 38.5% of fifth graders are able to read at second grade level. Similarly, only about 21.6% of fifth graders are able to do math at second grade level. These are 2022 statistics. Uh, there is some COVID effect there, but even pre-COVID, the numbers were not uh, much greater. So this realization has been there uh, across the board, among policymakers, among the teachers, among everybody in the education sector. But we need to take this head on. And uh, what better way to take this head on than uh, uh, you know, completely transforming the education uh, system through technology? If, and that's a big if, if it is done equitably uh, across the board. So the policy recommendation that we have is that we do a digital transformation of teaching and learning, a complete digital transformation that includes the device access, digital content, bandwidth, and uh, extensive teacher training. I will talk about that in my next slide. So first, the digital access. I would like to propose that we provide a device for each and every child from grade one to 12 meaning the device should be given to the child in the classroom and to be taken to, uh, to, to be taken home. That is when we will achieve real parity uh, in education. So I know there are going to be some immediate cost concerns. I'll address them in a, I'll address them in a minute. But so device is the first thing. Next thing is content. Uh, we have to have open source content we have Deeksha platform, that's a great start. I'm now speaking mainly in Indian context. Uh, the Deeksha platform is a great start. Uh, we have fantastic content there, may not be as clean and as streamlined as some of the edutech uh, content, but this is where government can invest and with a bit of effort, we can, the, the content can be streamlined and standardized. So, but so we have content. We have proven that there is content, digital content available. Next is bandwidth, right? That is most important. In urban cases, we all know that that is not an issue anymore. In rural also, the bandwidth is not much of an issue. We are almost getting there. But agreed, there will be areas where there is serious concern for bandwidth. That is where government needs to step in and provide hubs in schools or maybe in uh, uh, panchayat libraries. There are some good examples in, in the state of Karnataka where that is being done. Uh, so that is how we can solve the uh, uh, issue of bandwidth as well. Now let's take a quick look at the cost. This is a simple back of the cover uh, 
uh, calculation that we have done, uh, you know, if we want to give a device to each and every child, uh, 25 crore children going to public school, so that's about 250 million children, and I have, I'm, I've just made an assumption of 8,000 rupees for a device, uh, when we are producing at such a mass scale, that should not be, uh, th that is on par, I believe. So with that, it's only coming to about 2 trillion rupees. Uh, and if we spread it over five years, that is not much. Uh, for example, currently we are spending about 2.9% of GDP on education. Uh, in the NEP, uh, in fact, in all the NEPs, the national uh, education policies, the target has always been at 6%. We have never achieved that. Uh, so even if we increase it by one more percent, we should be able to cover these costs. I know I have just covered the cost of the devices. There will be more costs for bandwidth and teacher training. But this is, a, this is just to give you an impression that the immediate knee-jerk reaction of, no, it is too expensive, uh, is really not true if we take a close look. That is, that is what I would like to impress upon. So next, the most important thing, most critical thing is the teacher training. The environment in the classroom needs to be changed. Uh, so first of all, a huge effort needs to go into teacher training. Uh, and again, there are so many examples. Uh, the mindset of the teachers need to be changed. Uh, again, I have been talking to several teachers, sampling of several teachers, both in India and USA. The teachers are really uh, you know, looking forward for change. Uh, there are always about 30% of uh, go-getters. Uh, and then once they are energized, they will take the next 50%. Let's not worry about the last 20% any time, in any situation. So once we focus on the first 30% of teachers, uh, and, and, to, and they will become the uh, tr you know tr transformative leaders within the within their schools. Uh, we need to change the environment. The teaching needs to change into more of an interactive environment, and that will happen when the child also has a device. When each child also has a device, and then this is not a one-time effort. There has to be continuous training for teachers. I think we are making progress, but this has to be a a very serious effort for several years to make this into, into the system. And then the teachers need to be trained to uh, uh, teach using customized module, both for slow learners as well as high learners as well. So that customization needs to be, uh, uh, need to be trained to the teachers so they can implement with the, uh, uh, with the children. Uh, once again, as I said in, in my introduction, Viba has been working with several models. Uh, we have a motivational model uh, from an organization called Sikshana. We have English teaching and learning mod modules that we are implementing in several states already in Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Chhattisgarh. Uh, we have math, math modules from Akshara, uh, which we have implemented in uh, Karnataka and Odisha and uh, uh, so some good FLN modules from LLF that are again introduced in several states. So we have models. Uh, we know that we have uh, these models available uh, for teacher training uh, and, and, and student learning. So this is, this is also there, we, we have the expertise. Um, and finally, I would like to conclude that the time is now. Uh, you know, we, we, if, if India can do this, in the next five years, uh, and uh, if India can do in a, such a populous country can do this in the next five years, uh, putting that extra one percent of GDP uh, and focus on teacher training, and uh, if, uh, and then all other countries can take example from India, and together uh, we can achieve the United Nations uh, United Nations SDG four, uh, which states that ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. The goal was 2030, right, to achieve this SDG 4, and we can do it, and that's why the time is now. As I said, some of these concepts are not new. Uh, several developed countries have already deployed a device for every child, uh, and, and, uh, and, and maybe many other countries, the wheels may be in motion to uh, implement this, but 
I want to take this opportunity to focus on the urgency of this proposal, to do it now, so that we can achieve this SDG 4 by 2030. Thank you. Thank you, Vijayji. Very, very uh, articulate in your presentation of ideas and suggestions. I also hope that your dream for us to be able to achieve you know, quality education for all, equitable, accessible education is achieved in the shortest amount of time, even earlier than 2030, hopefully, if we can. Uh, so I think I'll just go on to the next speaker here. I have with us uh, Ms. Uh, Catherine Devonport, who has been a volunteer at the non-governmental organization Embracing the World for 29 years. And I think very recently she has been working on something very spectacular as part of the Amrita Create team, really developing and designing content on the Amrita Learning App. And this actually got selected by the Barbara Bush Foundation's XPRIZE Award being the top five finalists in 2018. And um, specifically, the app focused on adult education, if I'm right. So uh, being a teacher for over three decades, would love to hear from you what your thoughts on, are on how to create you know, technology design to be able to effectively share uh, you know, concepts, educational concepts to learners. Thank you kindly. I'm very, I'm very happy to be here, and um, I just want to, I can't resist to piggyback a little bit on the last presenter's comments. It reminded me of, on the first day, the fellow who was the ex-minister of uh, education in Mauritius, was it? How he told the World Bank, you're killing our country if you take away the funding for education. and. It's, it's, it's worse than having cancer or terminal cancer if your education system isn't working. The children are the future of the country. You're killing the future of the country if you don't rectify this. The, um, the statistics, statistics you gave are so alarming to me. And um, as a person who's been in education a long, long time, um, I understand truly uh, yes, teacher education, not only that, the people educating the teachers are the ones that need to be deselected the most carefully. Because not just anyone can train a teacher. You have to have someone that, that not only has the skills and the record of producing those results you want, but who can set a fire under the teachers where they're like, yes. Because it takes a lot of courage to be a teacher in the classroom and to implement new things. And you know, I have a lot of courage. I spent almost every day in my classroom being scared because I was always trying something new. And you've got, in USA, I, I had 34. And every child is at a different level. I mean, even in the USA where I was teaching, they have different language backgrounds also. Can, they can, in, in my classroom, I'd have like 10 different language backgrounds. English wasn't spoken at home. People read at so many different levels. And it takes a lot of courage to scrape up what activities you n know you need to do to bring the whole group along in a very pushy manner and get them excited about learning. And so um, uh, I would say that you might cons we might consider as a proposal one of the things that we suggest to the G20 is um, to, uh, to somehow make room for uh, rigorous teacher training at such a level that certain benchmarks are reached at a certain point in time, um, like to really make it concrete like that. Um, I know that uh, in the US it's done state by state, and California pushed for certain things 
that made a huge difference in the learning of the children there. So it can be done, and the research is there. So I just wanted to be like a cheerleader on the side, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> yeah, um, that needs so much attention. Well, I put my notes like here because I thought we might have six people and they'd be like hemming and hawing when it reached four minutes. So I have a two-minute blurb and a three-minute video. And I just put it together to make sure that I'd remember to say everything I wanted to. And I can't hide my paper on the podium. So I'll try to look natural while I'm reading from my paper. Um, greetings and pronouns to all who are here for this session. I'll talk briefly about my experience serving with the CREATE team. CREATE is a division of Amrita University that creates technology to address specific uh, educational needs. In 2016, I started serving with CREATE by writing content and designing curriculum for an app to serve adults with low literacy in the USA. We were designing this app specifically to compete for the Barbara Bush Foundation X Prize funded by Donner, Do Dollar General. Uh, the top prize is $2 million. So we thought, yeah, we'll go for that. I was creating content which was suitable for people reading it at levels between the third to fifth standard because that matched my personal experience of where a lot of adult learners were that I knew. And also, um, I was designing with some Spanish support because we have a lot of Hispanic people in the USA. Um, in 2017, XPRIZE announced that our team, the CREATE team, was one of five semifinalists in the contest. We were told our app would be distributed to a thousand random people living in poverty who would be paid money to take the standardized reading test and money again to retake it one year later after using our app. I want you to think for a moment, you're hearing this on a conference call, you're hearing that the people selected are gonna be random and they're gonna be living in poverty. So some questions started popping up in our, all of our minds right away. But only one person was brave enough to voice the question. Um, one brave person asked, is it possible that some of the people taking the test would be completely illiterate? We all knew the answer to that. The answer came, yes, definitely, there may be some non-readers, no English, no reading, nothing. And also at least half of them will speak Spanish. So these people may not know English. The silence filled the air on that phone call. Everybody had created apps for ad adults that could read at least simple English. You know, we had fully produced the app, right? Everybody had. We scrambled to prepare content and accommodations so that our app would be useful to illiterate users and non-English speakers and rolled out the redesigned app in time to be included in the contest. While the title of this C20 group includes the term emerging technologies, I want to point out to everybody that you can have an existing technology that feels like an emerging technology. When you're asked to produce a product to a group that probably does not know how to use it, including designing it for learners who are not confident learners and probably not confident using a smartphone either. When you're talking about resource limited settings, when you're designing a product for a group that is already underserved, it's not likely to be funded in a sustainable way. When your product depends upon internet service or data packs in a poor area, more problems need to be solved. 
We ended up creating an app where only a functioning skeleton of an app was downloaded at any one time. It looked like a full app, but only the first lesson was available in any menu item. Um, our lessons were extremely, and are extremely media rich, so this way we could keep the size small enough that people in a data poor or internet poor area could at least download the app. In fact, XPRIZE downloaded the app onto their app for them, but we wanted to make things so that we were reducing their reliance on the internet to use the lessons. So, we figured they could download a few lessons at a time at a local McDonald's, because that's what a lot of people, poor people do in the US. They go to a fast food restaurant, most of which have internet. Um, then the lessons offload automatically after about four days, or they can be removed with an icon to make more, more space. So then the person can download the next set at McDonald's. They can go a couple times a week. The app finally made finalist status and was one of four apps approved for national distribution as our app demonstrated by the pre and post standardized tests over that year period that uh, learners had made the minimum of the one year level progress. So our accommodations at least worked. The app, um, and at this point, um, I'm gonna, we're gonna see the three minute video. That will be the end of the presentation for me, but I wanna jump to policy recommendation. Um, I feel government should, be, should actively research and develop satellite-based internet services, such as that being pioneered by Starlink. This would have global implications of delivering internet to remote areas. Um, as well as strengthen the military security of any nation. So military budgets could be convincingly lobbied to do this. It doesn't have to be proposed as an education thing, um, and, and that might get the whole thing across. Everyone working in the field of education uh, recognizes that access to the internet is the main barrier for the poor or remote areas. Okay, so um, you've got the YouTube link, I think. I'm going to show you the three-minute older version of our app. Right now, uh, next month, we're rolling out a new version that will have multiple accounts so families can use the app. Welcome to Amrita Learning. Our program is a complete reading curriculum designed to be fun and easy to use. In this app, you will find complete instruction of the alphabet sounds with a short engaging video for each letter. Complete instruction of word building skills, starting with CVC words. A reading curriculum of stories interwoven with factual life skills passages. A reading library with fun and interesting stories and important articles. A 350-word picture dictionary with English and Spanish audio. Vocabulary bingo and other learning games to support lesson vocabulary. Spanish vocabulary support is found throughout the app including some fully bilingual stories. Spanish support will increase with each future update. Quality voice audio is used throughout the lessons and games. The girls must now give their phones to Angel every night at 10 o'clock p.m. To navigate, Use the picture menu to find your way around the app. The back button will help you move around inside the lessons. 
You can update your app or watch videos on how to use this app by choosing the question mark icon. The filter tool icon on the right offers access to every level and activity on this app. Educators, choose the drop-down menu to unlock the intermediate stories for ease of reviewing stories. Welcome to Amrita Learning App, made for adult learners. Hey, did you know that you can build amazing dashboards? Um, I want to point out how surprising it is to me, but there's like almost no apps for adult learning readers on the market. And it's because there's no money to be had in that market, okay? So it was pretty stunning, really. But you'll see all the different accommodations you might have noticed that were made for people with low digital skills, because people who have low literacy skills and they don't sometimes even know how to scroll on their phone. And so, um, yeah, that's why we added all those extra videos on how to use the app and the picture menu for the uh, non-readers. You didn't see, but there are little speaker icons where they could press the button and hear the title of the menu item they were choosing. And the uh, alphabet letter lessons were all using um, adult imagery. So um, in any event, these are just examples of what I would say were things created specifically. It, it turns it into an emerging technology just from the fact that there's not really much done with adult apps. The one that took first prize was actually designed for children, and it still had a lot of children's imagery in it. Um, so just to say there's, um, it definitely still qualifies as emerging technology, I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much. Before I ask a few more questions to the panelists, I'd just like to open it up to the audience if they had any questions for the panelists. Now would be a good time to maybe share your thoughts as well. Yes, please, sir. Yes, I am A.K. Singh from Jharkhand. I head an organization called LEADS, and I am also a convener of Jharkhand Right to Education Forum. So I have some contradiction with uh, the figure you presented here, about 98% children of uh, India has access to the government schools or any schools. But the new education, uh, national education policy document says in the preface itself, there's uh, 20, 26, uh, uh, 26 uh, 2 crores, 60, 000, 60 lakhs children are out of a school. And this policy will also comply to support those children so that they can be in their school. So that, that figure is up to, and almost uh, 26 crore children are studying in the government school all across the country. So this percentage is much higher than the 2%. Secondly, uh, if you go, you go through the eastern part, we move all across the country, and if you go in, in, into the uh, rural area, you'll find any school, if you drop in, in at any, any, any day, you'll find that only 55 to 60 percent, percent children are in schools. Rest are out of school. They're not in schools. Although they're enrolled, but they're not regular to a school, and as per the government definition, that if continued, they continue uh, absent, in their school for 15, 15 days, then they'll be considered as a dropout. So what teachers do, they, on 15th day, they make a, one attendance so that they are not considered as a dropout. So this is the uh, things which are uh, uh, not accessible. Most of the children are 
Many of the children are not accessing uh, education from the government schools. Second, uh, this education is in the concurrent list of our constitution. Government of India has also a role to play, and the state government has also a role to play. What they do, if you increase the budget even, what they do, they allocate the budget in the state budget, and there is a 30-70 approximately ratio, 30% government, government of India supports and 70% state government supports as per their revenue, state revenue. So what happens in the process, if, if they allocate the fund in the state budget, suppose Jharkhand has allocated 10,000 crore rupees for education. So what happens, they allocate 10,000 crore rupees, but in actual term, they only spent 4,000 crore rupees. They are busy in giving salary to the uh, para teachers and teachers, and the other promotional activities are not taking place. And because of that, the quality of education is degraded like anything. This is the only case I am sharing from Jharkhand, but we are connected with all 22 states of the country, and almost everywhere you'll find the same thing. And they speak that we have located the fund, but this is not the, in real term, they are not spending the same amount for the children. So even then, if government increases 1% of GDP, that will not impact much if a state do not agree to the whole system of, so, so why it happens? Because in many places, many in the many uh, domains, the government is spending a lot of money, but why they are not spending on the education? Because India is a democratic country and children of elementary education are not uh, having uh, power to vote, so they are not voter of the any government. That's why they do not consider this, that they are the, their priority. So what I am saying, uh, it's a, um, uh, it's if you provide the opportunity to, 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 to the children, they perform like anything. I am also working in the many schools and digitalizing the schools in Jharkhand. And wherever we have made the school digital and use, uh, supported the children, the tribal children, tribal girls, even Amma, this uh, Amma organization is also working in Jharkhand, some of the area where we are also working. So you'll find the children, girls and boys are doing marvelous things. They, have, they are doing in the game, in drawing, in competition, they are doing very good but we are not able to provide them opportunity so that they can come forward. So that is the issue. So we should also uh, discuss in this forum or uh, come with those recommendations, okay, what, uh, what suggestion we can put forward uh, to the government of India or to the country like the poor country who are not providing support to their children, that they should promote their own human resource properly so that the nation can uh, uh, come forward. Because if human resources is not developed properly, then we cannot say that we are developed or de uh, properly developing country like this. So uh, there is very critical area as far as education is concerned. We are doing some model work, but by and large, Adivasi children, Dalit children, and girls even. Because the, in family, we usually in Jharkhand, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, usually people send their boys to the private schools and girls to the government schools. So it is important to facilitate resources to the government schools so that it can cater the large segment of the society. So that is my submission to the uh, whole thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have another speaker. Uh, thank you so much for initiating this this, this discussion. Uh, actually, this uh, room is for uh, how to technology uh, inclusion in education, absolutely. And then I would, uh, I mean, I couldn't uh, listen uh, this first speak, uh, first speaker, but here in the Vipa, I would uh, as he pointed out, I would like to uh, share some of my views with you, sir. Because in education, you, I mean, showed some uh, statistics here. I do not want to contest with that, but I, I would like to ask you one thing. I mean, we have to ask by ourselves because 38 uh, percent, I mean, they they do not know read and write, uh, or 72 percent are not 
reaching uh, 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 reaching the school every day basis these are the problems we identified from years ago still it is continuing we are finding fault with our system of education or systemic change in the field of education but at the same time what are the solutions we can put forward here in the room for avoiding such loopholes uh, uh, you know that in the new education policy many many important things are there you to take it up properly uh, not only by the government alone but the ngos as well as the private educational institutions everywhere the syllabus we prepared for the schools it is actually a age old syllabus but now we are speaking about technological changes how many industrialist are there when we formulate curriculum content for the school or the colleges you have it to link education with industrialist when you prepare the curriculum you invite the educationist or the important people from infosys or wipro in the in case of india or amrita or anywhere else do, do you do we have such process in formulating either syllabus or developing content this is the greatest lacuna in our indian education system i did not know. of course in the western countries also they concentrate only one concept one one time because i am basically a researcher in the field of education i traveled to 48 countries across to learn education system alone Educa this is my passion that is what this room also i would like to bring these things for further discussion so in the technology inclusion will not cannot complete without the inclusion of the industrialist or technological experts you know our education system either you studied in amrita or studied in symbiosis or studied in uh, cet in trivandrum i mean very old education i mean engineering colleges the syllabus are the same you are not uh, the, then only after complete think you are plus two level education you are uh, uh, listening some of the words even in engineering also they are not studied from school level onwards technology you should include in the school curriculum then when you reach a 10th standard he can or plus two level he can decide by himself that i will go for mechanical engineering or i will go for painting this is the option for the students not for the parents now the parents are desire, they decide my child my son will go for engineering my daughter will go for medicine that is absolutely a waste or stupid type of education we are following right now but at the same time if you include technology in the school level the child will get an information about technology when you reach a 12th standard he can say that i wanted to uh, opt uh, science or uh, maths or humanities then it go for engineering the most of the words are words are familiar i mean concepts are familiar with the student that is absolutely absent these days this room should discuss about initiate that discussion further then you can we can reach check i mean we can conclude meaningfully this is my humble suggestion whatever you want to introduce whatever field you want to develop you develop from school onwards it is not the uh, only solution for giving digital mobile or something like that that is a tool this is a tool not a not an absolutely this is a solution this dev given device digitalization is absolutely necessary but gadgets using is a tool not only as a solution for our problem uh, i uh, i am i am so uh, sorry to uh, take more time uh, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity thank you so much thank you thank you thank you Um, so uh, I'm, I've only been in India a year, so I can't really, uh, I don't have a lot of deep knowledge about the Indian education system. 
I'm a teacher. I was also a teacher trainer in the UK for computer science, training teachers to teach IT and computer science. And I just thought it might be helpful to just uh, consider some of the, the, the figures that you were looking at about, again, putting, sorry, it's for Biba again, but putting devices in children's hands. Because I, I agree with uh, my colleague here when she said that it is just a tool. And I think that there needs to be an infrastructure in place, which includes a, a suitable curriculum at the right age. But also, there's actually very practical considerations. I have been, because I'm doing a PhD, I've been to schools in, in Rajasthan, and I went to one school, and they had 20 or so beautiful computers in the headmaster's office, all beautifully set up, plugged into new sockets and everything, but actually they didn't have sufficient current to run them. And they didn't have trained staff who knew how to use them. And they didn't have tech, technical staff. And having worked in IT and computing from when they first you know, put it in schools in, in the UK, technicians are the absolute, they're the absolute must in a school. You have to have people at that level. So you need to budget for that as well. It's not just a one-off uh, area. It's something that needs to be continuous. And in Australia and in the UK, when we started putting devices in children's hands, the technical support overheads are so much greater. So I think that really has to be considered. It's a beautiful idea. It can be done. It is being done around the world. But there's other considerations that need to be put in place before we put the devices in children's hands. And there's all the issues as well about uh, cybersecurity and et cetera. And for the technical staff to implement it, it is, it's a vast undertaking, and if they're still struggling with it after putting devices in hands over 10 years ago in places like the UK and Australia, if India can learn from the things that went wrong, that would be, be beneficial. Thank you. Uh, absolutely, yeah. So, in fact, when my child was in middle school uh, in the USA, and when she was given a device, to every child, is government paying for it? How are they going to scale this up? These were my thoughts about eight, nine years ago. But now, you know, a device, but of course, this got accelerated during COVID, but even post-COVID, in the new normal, a device for every child has, has become an expectation. If any school does not provide a device for every child, it is uh, considered a considered a poor, poor, poor district and then now corporates are pitching into support uh, that district. So which means there is an expectation now. Now when you think of parity, you know, the technology in, in, in education is, in fact, COVID has proven that it, it is, in fact, even more discrimination, uh, creating even more discrimination in learning. So as the technolo technology in education is has come to stay. Even in India, it has come to stay. Now, unless we take a big leap and work at equity, and if we do this slowly, then that disparity uh, is going to grow uh, between the haves and the have-nots, and the, you know the, the, the semi-private sector and the private sector and the public schools. The divide is going to be, the digital divide is going to grow even more and more. That is why I'm saying this, it's an urgency to, to, to take that step. I completely agree with you that this is not a one-time thing. And, and, and uh, uh, there are going to be costs in maintaining and so on and so forth. But wherever we have seen implementation of it, it's, it's not alarming, I will tell you that. Whether it is in USA or in India. In India also there are, in, in, for example, in Andhra Pradesh, they have uh, given devices to all eighth graders. Uh, in all the entire state, uh, uh, and, and and when I talk to the teachers, how are you managing? How is this? They said we, we are fine managing it, managing it okay. I mean, it's not a concern. Now, to address your another question about the devices and the computers are there, but there is nothing there. They're not being. You are absolutely right. So, what is missing there is the teacher training. You know, the so giving devices and just stopping there is completely meaningless. That's why devices. Bandwidth, content has to be there. Continuous teaching, teachers training is a must. The teacher
teacher needs to be transformed. There's no doubt about that. But with reference to content, once again, I want to submit to you that there's enough content, there's good enough content. It needs to be streamlined and standardized. And, and yes, ma'am, it needs to be streamlined and standardized for all grades in all regional languages. And again, I, I have not touched about and there are a few host of issues like uh, security and and so on and so forth. All that will come in. But all that will come in once we take this big step. That is what that's what I think. Yeah. Someone else? Sir, to just talk one minute. Yeah, I think uh, uh, it was brilliant, actually, all the three speakers uh, spoke on various aspects, and even the queries raised by some of you are very relevant. Many things are already happening. Some of you may be aware, some of you may not be aware by the government of India, and that's why I said I'm having a session later. Anyway, I'll speak there as well. But I think most important thing which is required at this juncture is the teacher training, which uh, is already mentioned by you. That is because devices are there, internet penetration is happening, there are DTH channels which are presently 33 are going to be increased to 260. In all languages right from class 1 till class 12, grade 12, there will be education in regional languages, in individual languages going to happen. At AICT we developed an AI based translation tool for translating content in English into all Indian languages. So that a person in a very remote rural area also is in a position to get the education at his doorsteps. You know, so there are many things which are happening. Madam, most important thing which has been talked about in the policy, which is National Education Policy 2020, is about transforming the entire education system based on all the queries and all the doubts, all the anxieties that are there, they are addressed there. But the real challenge is we have to implement it. You know, the new education policy talks about changing the present 10 plus 2 system to 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4, early childhood education starting at the age of 3. In terms of, madam, what you said, uh, very interesting content in terms of stories, games, toys, so that a child would feel that I have to go to the school. You know, on a holiday, the child will ask parent, why is their school not there today, rather than uh, disinterested in going to the school. So that is the change that is required to happen. Subsequently, at the age of about sixth standard onwards, skilling, you know, vocational education being imparted. And skilling is both hands-on skills, which are physical, as well as AI skills, uh, machine learning skills, right from the school age. So industry connect, which you talked about, is going to happen through the curriculum being revised. Already AI is introduced in the school curriculum. So I think such kids, when they come after their you know, 12th grade, they would be doing a very good, high quality, uh, higher education with a lot of innovation and research. But more significantly, the education from the 8th grade onwards, the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, is going to be completely liberal based education where a student of physics can take uh, philosophy, a student of chemistry can take computer science, a, a student of uh, mathematics can take music, and such combination is possible, thereby the student will realize what is his interest, what is the talent that he would like to develop. And rather than depending on parents, relatives, forcing you, thrusting you into medical or engineering education, they will be able to take a call on what is their interest and, and then probably move ahead. So there are many transformational changes happening and the credit uh, framework or the curriculum framework being designed by none other than former ISRO chairman, Dr. Kasturi Raggan for the nation at the school level. A person who is a research scientist of the caliber of a chairman of a national agency of uh, space is talking about school curriculum and he's devising that curriculum. I think the changes are imminent. There is a large amount of hard work which is ongoing, but it is not the only government. It is all NGOs, individuals, people like you, me, all sitting in this room. How can I contribute to the nation? You know, this is what is more important at this change. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I know that we had a, one more speaker. If you can kindly summarize in a minute uh, your uh, thoughts. Mm, um, okay. No, I'm uh, quite intrigued that you mentioned uh, things like the ultimate experience in the classroom. That's, um, that's not great. 
um, I feel, yeah, indeed that the, uh, I think we have started thinking that we'll solve the problem of education purely by using digital tools or by fixing teachers somehow. And to me that um, sounds quite absurd. Uh, ultimately, if you're not uh, questioning the pedagogy, if you're not questioning what a child experiences in the classroom, we're trying to grow basically orange trees in sand. I mean, it, this uh, digital transformation to me means nothing um, without uh, any idea of transforming education, without the idea of transforming that experience that one child in the classroom faces. And um, how would that happen if all this policy discussion happens without children at all, uh, right? Uh, there's no children here. There's no children who contributed to writing the policies. And to me, the, the kids are the ones who are actually going to experience the outcomes of these policies and they're completely missing from the conversation. Um, that's criminal to, to me. I mean, that's um, how, how could we do that? How could we think that we are um, capable enough in all our um, almighty goodness that all of us put together can decide what's right for the children who are coming and living in a reality we, we all have never lived. So, um, yeah, what's your take Thank on you. that? That would be nice. Thank yeah. you. One last comment there. I think we are running short of time. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. I was trying not to speak, but I had to. <laughs> uh, my name is Kannan. I'm, the, I'm a colleague of Vibha and uh, of Vijay. I'm the former CEO of Vibha and a founder and CEO of a cybersecurity company. I'm also based in Atlanta. Uh, USA, but I, I'm actually from Trivandrum. And I want to remind the gentleman here that we were all children once. You know, so, um, and when I was growing up, we all used to have instrument boxes. If you remember, you know, that's what we used to learn, you know, geometry and, you know, basic trigonometry and stuff like that. The device is nothing but an instrument box. You know, and that's the way to think about it. And the whether we accept it and we can keep on debating whether we need it, how to implement it, those are all the tacticals. But the reality is that it is a non-negotiable in the new world. And unless we make it a priority to get every child a device in a timely fashion, we run the risk of leaving a large segment of the population behind. You know, uh, so the, the, the whole approach uh, towards um, education should be of you know, no child left behind, right? And in, in terms of equitable distribution of uh, education access, uh, one of the key considerations and the key um, elements is, is implementing the infrastructure. And all the conversation that I've been noticing is that the infrastructure is around the new infrastructure, satellite connectivity, high bandwidth connections, but we, lot, we should also look at the conventional infrastructure that is already in place. Uh, India has the example of setting the most remote election booth. We actually have it in our law saying that no voter should walk more than three, uh, three kilometers to cast a vote, right? Um, it, could, it should be legislated that no child should be walking more than a kilometer or two kilometers to gain access to education. Similarly, we have the example of post offices in remote locations which are being shut down. These post offices and the postal network could be repurposed re to deliver or act as a delivery mechanism uh, to routinely provide um, in updated tablets. So I think it's a mindset change. We can definitely look at all the av available resources which are existing, the legacy ones as well which can be repurposed. So, uh, if, so if these things are taken into consideration, you know, this is not a hard challenge. You know, it's, it's a big challenge, but it's not a hard challenge. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, we are completely short of time, so I'd like to just maybe request everybody to just summarize in just exactly a minute. So that sure. Can um, I just have to echo on two points here. One, uh, ma'am said that she had missed my presentation, but it touched upon something that was relevant in the healthcare education part. Uh, you talked about uh, skills, uh, and uh, I totally agree with that, and that's why we are advocating for competency-based healthcare education. So I talked more about that, but then that applies across the board. Like, your training 
or your education should be based on skills. What does the child want to learn? What does the adult want to learn in terms of skills? What skill does they, do they want to learn that they are going to use going forward? Even if you're talking, she talked about industrialists being a part of that education so that the child knows, okay, this is what I want to do when I grow up. And so this is the skill that I, I need to learn. Same applies for healthcare education. So if, if a uh, healthcare worker needs to learn a particular skill because that's what's going to helpful, be helpful in, the, uh, in his or her work, uh, that's the, it, the education should be around that. So the competency-based medical education is what we are advocating there. Similarly, in healthcare education, before we start educating, we do a training needs assessment. Do they need this training? Does the learner need this training? What kind of training do they need? And that's what uh, Sayed mentioned, that we should be asking the children the same thing. You know, is this what you, is this what you want to learn? Is this, is this how you should be learning it? You should be taking a feedback loop on that also. You know, did you like it? What I taught you, did you like it? Did you f feel that it was uh, you know, uh, good enough for you? Did you feel that you learned something from it? So that's something that needs to apply for everything, for education across the board, be it in the professional sphere, be it in, in the, the initial part of our uh, you know, learning as a child. So I think that that's something uh, uh, that you know, I echo with uh, those thoughts, and I think that's also what I was trying to present in our presentation here, that one, skilling, two, you need to also ensure that it's, uh, it's very focused to the audience. What, what, what does the audience want? What does the learner want? And is, is it, is it uh, uh, interactive? Is it applicable for him? Is the tool effective for that pers person? It's just a tool anyway. Your technology is, like she said, it's a tool. But is it good enough? Is it, is it uh, being provided in the right way to, uh, to, uh, to the uh, learner? So that's all I have. Yeah. Now I have Your two. closing thoughts. <laughs> um, closing thoughts actually were stimulated by the young man in the front. Uh, for me, I feel he actually said the most important thing in the room, um, that we do need to listen to the children. And um, that needs to be part of the teacher training. We have to listen to the children because what else are we doing then? We're not there to create a bunch of robots. And if you move with the current of the children, they bring all their energy to bear and they get behind you as an educator and you create wonderful things together and amazing things. And so it's very important. I do agree that we have to get uh, a device in the hands of every child. I think it's absolutely necessary. And I think most children have the ability to learn way more than we can all by themselves with that device. Um, and that it needs to be monitored for them not going scary places with it. And that we might be able to work with the people who sell us the devices to make sure it can't go certain places. And um, and also that um, I did have a thought. Wait, I'm getting senior on this, but it was an important one. Give me 10 seconds. Oh, that if the resources aren't there, I've worked in two different school districts where we had carts. And the fourth and fifth grade teachers would share a cart of computers. And then we would train the kids how to do certain things with our cart. And we had certain protocols between us that we knew how to deal with them nicely and teach the kids carefully how to care for them, how to put them away, how to regard them. And in some of those districts, they actually did state level assessments required those computers. And that made the ability of the state then to not simply have right and wrong answers on tests. If a child got an answer wrong on a test, the test would level down to an easier question so you could find the actual real specific level of that child, which was really a big deal. So I just wanted to point out that little tidbit. And thank you kindly for uh, letting me part of the discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'll make it quick. 
Uh, just two points. Number one, to uh, the senior uh, uh, sir from the representing the views of the government. Uh, yes, you know, in, in fact, in my journey of 30 years in Vibha, uh, one thing I have noticed is the governments, both the central government and the state governments, are more receptive to the ideas from the non-profits, and the non-profits have stepped up and, and doing a lot of experiments and bringing models. You know, I have shown some of the models that uh, we, we have. So there is a lot of collaboration between the non-profits and the government. So that's a huge welcome sign in the last 20, 30 years. And, and in, those exper in those models is where the views of the children, how that is where the experiments are done at the grass, at, at the level, in the classroom. That is where these, these, these organizations are able to learn, you know, what, what is working, what is not working. That is where you should think that we are actually taking the feedback from the children and, and developing and, and tweaking the curriculum and so on and so forth. I wanted to address those two points. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to actually just close this session with my own some, a few of my own thoughts. I think uh, we've heard very well from the panelists and also from the audience, extremely important aspects to what makes holistic education successful. What are the important stakeholders that we need to bring into play to be able to make this all happen? And my own thoughts are that one, we should be able to address the socioeconomic barriers that really impact quality education. The, the, the second part of it is we talked about quality assurance, what are technologies, how do they impact you know, addressing quality uh, monitoring systems, et cetera. And thirdly, I think all of us know that the teachers we remember the most are the ones that really sparked that fire in us to be able to learn that made us perform well. So fundamentally, beyond just teacher training, et cetera, what are those that really help us understand a teacher-student interaction? How can we really use technology perhaps to be able to uh, assist both the teachers and the students, enhance that attract, uh, interaction, enhance that collaboration. So ultimately, it is an enjoyable experience, um, like you said, inside the classroom. And, and also an important aspect of it is that children are different. Not all of them are alike. How do we really make it enjoyable for as many as possible throughout our educational system? With those closing thoughts, I don't want to keep you away from your uh, tea outside. I also want to announce that there's a very exciting uh, panel discussion that's going to happen at 11.30 on cultivating compassion, self-awareness, and sensitizing the community for inclusion, led by our president of uh, Amrita Vishwadhyaya Peter himself. So please... Um, get your tea and come to the hall. With that, thank you once more.